Welcome back to the shop, ladies and gentlemen. Um, today will be part four, and this will be the finale of this little engine build that I did. Uh, I call it my Frankenstein engine, as uh, if you remember, Dr. Frankenstein got all different types of body parts and assembled them together to create a human being, or a monster if you want to call it that. Well, this is my monster. So in today's video, we're going to be taking a look at the ignition system, the fuel system, and the exhaust system, and a quick look at this dodgy stand that I made. Now the ignition system went down quite a few design iterations or variations. At first I thought I'd be really clever and I'd cut out the magnet little coil pack off a whipper snipper motor and bolt it to the front of the flywheel and this was, this failed. It failed terribly. Alright, it was through the flywheel out of weight. When I spun the engine, the engine wanted to jump up and down. Um, now I could have cut the flywheel and inserted the magnet but I thought no, I wanted to keep the flywheel's integrity just in case later on down the track, I wanna try and run an alternator or something like that off this little motor. My end goal obviously would be to showcase this motor out of vintage machinery rally. I wanna start doing a few more engine builds. I enjoy it, I like it. Um, I actually started my life off as a motor mechanic before I went into engineering and then I jumped into school teaching. But anyway, that's another story. So that was the first iteration of the ignition system. The second one, I fitted an ignition system uh, that I got off Hobby King. Now, Hobby King made these little um, CDI ignition systems that would go on radio-controlled petrol engines, okay, uh, for aeroplanes or helicopters or whatever, whatever sort of RC purpose. I don't know what happened there, but the magic smoke came out of the box. It could have been because I had a lithium polymer battery up its backside, punched in a few amp, too many amps and blew the box. I'm not too sure. Uh, the other thing I could have done too is that the CDI got its grounding through the high tension lead, uh, like a braided line wrapped around the high tension lead uh, to a steel boot that would earth it out. And that's designed because most model airplanes are made out of balsa wood, so you can't earth it, okay? So it's got to carry its own earth down to the plug. And I think that's what blew it because the plug I used was too long and I didn't think that the boot wasn't touching it, so it could have open circuited that way and I blew it up. So that led me back to the drawing board where I went old school and I just bought a, a car ignition coil, a 12 volt coil, uh, non-ballast resistor type, a high tension lead, a suppressor, a set of points. Um, and funny enough, this stuff now is getting harder to get. Well, especially through my source here, I was going through a company called Repco who used to sell everything to the automotive trade. Now they just seem like, like a fast food chain. Just once you can get you out, that sort of thing. Anyway, look, I couldn't even get a condenser off them. They didn't have one. So I went rummaged through my old toolbox and I had an old test condenser that I had on a alligator clip when I was fault finding cars back in the day. So I stripped that and put that in here. Now the ignition plate's purpose, as I was saying, is to hold the points and to hold the condenser and all that sort of stuff. Now, the other purpose of the ignition plate is also to, so I can advance and retard the spark, okay? Now, as you know, if you're, you know, mechanically inclined or minded, you'll, you'll understand that ignition systems need to be able to advance and retard, okay? Now, usually they need to advance. As the engine goes faster, the spark needs to advance, so the spark fires before, more degrees before top dead center. Now, most of these advancing systems are either mechanical, vacuum, or they can also be done electronically. My little motor has none of that. It has no advancing. It's purely will just fire at 10 degrees before top dead center. And so as you get higher up in the rev range, it will start to retard, okay? Now, the timing plate started off just as a bit of three millimeter uh, sheet aluminum. And what I did, I just drew a circle, uh, cut the corners off of the circle with the bandsaw, put it in the lathe and sandwiched it together between uh, two little mandrels. So it's just a, a friction drive and just gently machined it round, okay? Once it was round, then I could apply the other machining strategy. So I took it over to the vertical milling machine, put it in my universal dividing head, uh, clocked it in, found center, and then I dropped over and cut that internal diameter out and that fitted around the extension shaft of the camshaft here. But to fit it, I didn't want to pull all this apart, okay? So I put a slot in it so the plate would slide down easily, okay? Then what I had to do is put those three slots at 120 degree offsets so I could advance and retard the timing to get the right fire when I wanted to fire the spark at the correct angle of the crank of the crankshaft, I could adjust it in like that, okay? Now, 
the points lobe cam, all right? That had me bamboozled. I thought, how am I gonna make this? I was actually gonna weld the camshaft extension and grind it and grind a lobe, and I just thought, too much effort. So I drew it in CAD and I 3D printed it. I 3D printed a simple points cam lobe, okay? Just made it up in my head. Roughly thought about you know, how it would work. I, I didn't want a, a cam lobe that snapped open instantaneously. I wanted to gradually open the spark, okay, or open the points. And 3D printed it, it took bugger all time. I came out super glued it onto the camshaft extension and Bob's your uncle, okay? Or auntie for that matter, if she's a cross dresser. I was wrapped, okay, got that set up. Bolted the coil on to the side here. Now I, I used the plate that I made to hold the timing chain adjuster. I thought, well, I've got that big ugly plate sitting there and the big ugly plate was so it could also hold design iteration number one of using the whipper snipper uh, ignition system, okay? So I thought, just use it. You've got this big chunk of real estate, bolt it on, okay? Away we go. High tension lead, had trouble getting high tension leads. They wanna see you a set, they don't wanna sell you one. Uh, Repco finally looked around, they found in their catalog they had one, but it was like a meter long. So I just looped it around, a meter's about three feet if you're wondering, okay? Or as Curtis would say, you know, three bananas, or I don't know, whatever he says. So I've looped it around here and plugged it on there and I'm happy with it. I bought a new spark plug as well. Moving on to the fuel system. I wasn't gonna do anything flashy. And if you looked at one of my other videos on my other channel, I interviewed a gentleman called Warwick who, who got an old radial engine and fuel injected it. Hey, I'm not that smart, all right? Uh, Warwick's way smarter than me. So he put injection on his motor. I just used the standard carburetor, but there was a problem. The intake manifold for this motor, this is originally a motorcycle engine, which lays over, okay? So this snorkel, if you want, this inlet manifold, curved up and around, okay? And it did a 90 degree turn. Now that wasn't going to help me. The carburetor has got a float bowl here. I need to make the float bowl nearly level, okay? Otherwise the engine could flood. So what I did is just cut and shut it. Quite simply, I put it in my bandsaw, roughly worked out the length, cut it, I beveled it on the grinder. So I just used JB Weld and, uh, and Peter, Peter from the PGS channel, he goes, it'd be interesting to see if that holds up, Aaron. And Peter, I've got to be honest with you, mate, I'm surprised it held up too. It's, it's as strong as a Mally ball. That JB Weld sticks like shit to a blanket, let me tell you that. Now, the carburetor was another problem. The gentleman who saw me said, oh, yeah, no, this motor runs, mate, all good. I paid 100 bucks for it or something like that. Well, when I finally dug the carby out of the box of bits, it was snapped off, okay? So the corner, as you know, the flange on a carburetor, half the flange was missing. So they obviously pulled the motor out and dropped the motor and it snapped the carby off. So pain in the ass. So I had to make another flange plate uh, on the milling machine. So I roughly just, I sketched around it, traced it, uh, cut it down with a hacksaw, chucked it in the mill, milled it to the lines, uh, jumped on the grinder, on the, sorry, on the uh, linisher and just radius the corners. And once again, JB Weld to the rescue, okay? I threaded and tapped it and glued the carburetor to the new flange that I made. I'm surprised it held up. It's strong. Like I said, it's as strong as a Mallee ball, all right? Um, I wouldn't swing off it, okay? I wouldn't try and lift it or whack it with a hammer. I'd probably break it. But like you can see here now, I can grab it and shake it. It's rather quite strong. Yeah. Exhaust system, guys. He gave me the original exhaust system with it. I just cut it off in the bandsaw and just bolted on this little small section here. I wanted to have a little bit of noise coming out and uh, it definitely does that. It definitely makes a noise and a lot of smoke for that matter. The stand, guys, the stand, honestly, it's as ugly as a hat full of arseholes, all right? Um, I need to build a better stand. This is me, uh, hence the term I use all the time, Humpty Dumpty Machining Company. This is the old motor mechanic coming out of me, just getting it done, getting the job done, get it out, right? Um, it's ugly. I had to do a stand because I needed some way of holding the motor. And uh, as you see later on in one of the videos, it actually, um, the, the whole bloody table started to lift and vibrate across the road. Right, because this, this is an air compressor and it's got no balance in it. So it was designed to run at a certain RPM, whatever the motor is. I think the electric motor is about 1600 or it was designed to run at anything over that, 
it's it's been the crank hasn't been balanced it's not a proper crank journal it's an oversized big end journal so normal a, a big end journal will be about that size well this journal's like that you know it moves around uh you know eccentrically and yeah it's not a proper crank this probably wasn't the best donor compressor to use when i do some deep reflection on this project look i'm, I'm not blowing my own trumpet but i'm extremely proud and uh of what i've achieved okay i i think i set out to achieve the goal i've got to be honest with you i didn't invent this project okay i saw it on youtube uh, a young vietnamese gentleman i think it's called let's learn something or something like that um, one of those channels or mr latran or something he did one of them, and i thought what a bloody brilliant idea i want to have a crack at that i want to challenge myself um, you theoretically could do this without all this equipment that i've got I've got the equipment, I love machining, and that's why I use it to my advantage. You could probably do this with a pedestal drill or a pistol grip drill, an angle grinder and, you know, a few spanners. You could probably knock one up yourself, all right? Um, but look, I'm proud of what I've achieved. Um, it runs. A lot of people said I couldn't do it. Um, I had a lot of knockers, a lot of doubters, and I've proved you wrong. I've got it running. It's a non-functioning mode. It runs. But look, it's not going to power a go-kart or a billy cart or whatever you want to put it in or a motorcycle. Why? Because there's a few things wrong with it, okay? It's got very poor cooling. There's no fan on here or anything like that. At least on a motorcycle, you're continuously moving forward. Stationary engine, not good. There's no fan blowing over the head. It's got no oil feed, okay? So there's no oil feed lubricating the rocker arms and the rocker shafts and valve train. That's why I'm running a small two-stroke mix in this with a bit of oil in the fuel. How could I improve it? Right, well, the first thing I would improve would be piss off this dodgy timber stand, make a nice timber stand for it. Like I said, my goal is to show these motors one day. When I get a bit older and I start traveling the vintage motor circuit, I'd like to take these with me and, and demonstrate to people and have a conversation with people. So, so the final improvement I would do would be to block off this front chamber here where the timing chain used to go and put a plate there drill one hole and have an oil return back into the crankcase. And this one here, the oil filler, I'd have a tube coming up here into one of these oiling holes. Because when it's running, oil squirts out of that because the sump is being, there's obviously some combustion and compression leaking past the rings, going into the sump, pressurizing the sump and shooting it out here. And there's a little tiny air breather hole in there. So really, I should use that to my advantage and pump that up into the engine. Oil return back into here you're off and racing with the lubrication. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for coming along this journey with me and, and looking at the build series. Um, once again, I apologize to my subscribers. I pretty much flogged you to death uh, the last week uploading these videos to YouTube. That's not my intention. My intention is purely to document my journey and hopefully I've inspired others to have a go and have a crack and get out into your shop and make something, okay? It's great for your mental health and it's good to get away from the misses. See you on the next video. Bye-bye.